Here we'll create a basic overview of the cerebrum, which includes such important structures as the cerebral hemispheres, brainstem, and cerebellum. Start a table so we can keep track of the various nervous system structures. Now draw a coronal section through the brain so we can study the cerebral cortex and subcortical white matter. Draw an inner layer and label the space between the layers as the cerebral cortex, which is a relatively thin shell of neuronal tissue. Denote that the cerebral cortex is the outer cellular gray matter of the brain. Now draw the subcortical white matter inner to the cerebral cortex, which forms a dense core of connection fibers, much thicker than the cerebral cortex. Denote that it comprises the underlying axons. Next draw the cerebrospinal fluid system within the center of the cerebrum. This system forms pockets of fluid deep in the brain. To note that the cerebrospinal fluid assists the meninges in nourishing and supporting the nervous system with essential nutrients and metabolites. Next, draw the brainstem below the brain. It's the basic seat of life. To note that the brainstem contains cranial nerve nuclei and other essential neuronal populations and fiber tracts. As such, it controls and carries the most primitive, most vital of our functions. Now on the posterior aspect of the brainstem, draw the leafy hemispheres of the cerebellum, which pack the cerebellum into a small nook within the posterior skull base, the posterior fossa. Denote that the cerebellum is fundamental for balance and motor coordination. It's a learning organ, which presumably relates to the adaptive nature of our balance center. Now draw a lateral view of the cerebrum. Denote that we'll learn the cerebral lobes, which constitute the bulk of the brain matter. Show them as follows. Superior anterior is the frontal lobe. It comprises a large portion of the brain. Denote that it's responsible for cognitive functions, such as language production and organizational skills, motor planning and initiation, and volitional eye movements. Thus, the frontal lobe both generates and the governs many discrete and important higher level actions. Superior posterior is the parietal lobe. Denote that it's responsible for sensory processing and spatial orientation. It guides us through our environment. Inferior is the temporal lobe. Denote that it's responsible for language comprehension and visual identification. It stores visual, auditory, olfactory, and other forms of information. Posterior is the occipital lobe. Denote that it's primarily known for visual reception and processing. Even a large occipital stroke will mostly only manifest with vision loss because of this area's dedication to vision. Next, draw the medial aspect of the cerebrum so we can inspect regions that are hidden in lateral view. As reference points, draw the corpus callosum a major white matter connection pathway, and the cingulate sulcus above it. Shade the lobes of the brain as follows. Superior anterior is the frontal lobe. Superior posterior is the parietal lobe. Inferior is the temporal lobe. And posterior is the occipital lobe. Central is the limbic lobe. Denote that it's best known for its role in memory, which localizes posteriorly, and emotional processing, which localizes anteriorly. Now draw the inferior surface of the brain. Draw one half only. We'll use the other half later for other purposes. Shade the lobes of the brain as follows. Anterior is the frontal lobe. Lateral middle is the temporal lobe. Medial middle is the limbic lobe. Posterior is the occipital lobe. Next, let's address fissures and sulci. Denote that invaginations exist along the brain as deep fissures, which alter the contour of the cerebral ventricles, and shallow sulci, which merely indent the outer surface of the brain. In the lateral hemisphere diagram, label two key invaginations. The sylvian fissure, also known as the lateral sulcus, the central sulcus, which extends from the apex of the brain to the sylvian fissure. 
Next, to note that cortical gyri are delineated segments of cerebrum. They're anatomically defined areas with discrete functions. Show that the precentral gyrus, which is the primary motor cortex, also known as primary motor area, lies anterior to the central sulcus within the frontal lobe. It initiates movement. Then show that the postcentral gyrus, which is the primary sensory cortex or primary sensory area, lies posterior to the central sulcus within the parietal lobe. It's the initial cortical reception site for sensation. Now let's transition to an inferior view of the brain to draw a few key deep brain structures, the basal ganglia and thalami. As a reference point, draw a cerebral ventricle, the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. Denote that the basal ganglia, also known as basal nuclei, are most notably involved in motor function, but have numerous other functions as well. Along the lateral wall, the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle, draw the head of the caudate, which is the anteromost portion of the basal ganglia. Posterolateral to it, draw the lens-shaped lentiform nucleus. Subdivide it into the putamen laterally and the globus pallidus medially. Imagine a putaminal shell around a globus pallidus core. Now medial to the lentiform nucleus, draw the thalamus of the diencephalon, which is the primary sensory relay center. Denote that it relays sensory information throughout the cerebrum. More broadly, however, it relays motor, cognitive, and other functions as well. Next, label the space between the lentiform nucleus, caudate head, and thalamus as the internal capsule, which comprises tightly packed fiber bundles that originate from widespread brain regions. Under subcortical white matter in our table, denote that the motor function of the internal capsule is the most clinically relevant. A stroke within the internal capsule causes a pure motor stroke. As an oversimplification, think of the thalamus for sensory input and the internal capsule for motor output. Now in our medial view, draw the hypothalamus of the diencephalon in the center of the cerebrum. To note that it's the cerebral center for the autonomic nervous system. Thus, hypothalamic injury causes widespread autonomic dysfunction, sometimes called autonomic storm. Label the pituitary gland, which produces and secretes hormones. Its posterior division is part of the hypothalamus. Label one of the mammillary bodies, which are involved in memory. Then draw the pineal gland, which notably creates and secretes melatonin. Lastly, let's draw a lateral view of the limbic lobe so we can learn about memory and emotional processing. Draw the corpus callosum, which again is a major white matter pathway. Then draw the basal frontal lobe, a key frontal connection within the limbic system. Superiorly, draw the cingulate gyrus, which functions in motivation and attention anteriorly and learning and memory posteriorly. Inferiorly, draw the parahippocampal gyrus, which shuttles information into and out of the hippocampus. Draw the hippocampus along the superior length of the parahippocampal gyrus. It's the major memory processing center. Anterior to it, draw the amygdala, which is the seat of emotional and behavioral processing. Then draw the mammillary nuclei. Next, the thalamus. Label the anterior thalamic nucleus. Show that the hippocampus projects via the fornix across the thalamus and down to the mammillary nuclei and basal frontal lobe. Show that the mammillary nuclei project to the anterior thalamic nuclei. Finally, show that the anterior thalamic nuclei project to the cingulate gyrus, which projects back to the hippocampus via the cingulum to close the pape circuit which is the cornerstone of memory consolidation. This concludes our diagram.